Thank you, Daddy. Kick that uh, PowerPoint there, Carter. We'd like to thank Andy Crow for his service today. And I never trust my memory, and I never can remember from one year, year to the next. Is there anyone else here this morning who has served in military service? James, James has. Okay, James, I do some. God bless you, brother, and thank you for your service. We do have some new members and new attendees, so we want to uh, make sure to recognize those folks. I had a picture of uh, Andy in his uniform, but don't, I don't have a picture of anybody else in their uniform. Do you still have your uniform, Andy? It's up, it's up in the attic. I'm, <laughs> okay. I can't wear it anymore, but yeah, I've got it. I understand. <laughs> well, we've all grown. We've all grown. Thanks to James Ward and to Andy Crow. And uh, you, do you have someone that's in your family? I know that we have two people that are on the prayer list that are in active service. Uh, Lucy Ward is uh, in reserve, and uh, and also Randall, uh, Anthony Randall, who is uh, in our family. Is there anyone else in your family, someone that you'd like to mention today, or someone who is a, a living? Servant of our armed served. forces. My dad served in the army. Did he? Okay. My uh, grandson Jacob is Air Force career. My uh -huh. brother served in the Marines. What did you say, John? My brother served in the Marines. Okay. Jeannie, you've got one in the service. Well, he retired. He's retired. But he is a retired Marines vet veteran. Anyone else? Someone else? <clears throat> all right, just so grateful. And as I said, there's all different kinds of... Danny said he was a part of a parade, and uh, I remember it's yesterday. There have been wreaths uh, laid and laurels uh, crowned and so forth. We do want to remember these folks and, and be grateful to them. If you happen to see... If you go out to eat today or out in, the, uh, out in town today, you see somebody, as, as I know that you always do, to thank them for their service. All right. Okay, let, let's, let's go on then. Uh, uh, we are thankful. There are many things to be thankful for. And, and sometimes we can, uh, we, it, uh, you can let yourself, uh, let the, the, the pointers this, of this world just point to bad things that happen or uh, tragedies or disasters. The world has been filled with those since the fall. But we have so many blessings of God, so many things to, to thank God for. I'm, uh, just in a few weeks, we'll be celebrating. We have a holiday just to say, don't forget to be thankful. We have a Thanksgiving day, but we should be thankful all the time. We should always be grateful. Be grateful. Being ungrateful is one of the greatest sins. Let's go on to the next slide. You know, I, I think that... Uh, you and I should be able, folks, to expect in, in, in 2024 to always, uh, as the great missionary said, to attempt great things for God and expect great things from God. More in 24. And uh, see God bringing more people to Himself, shining His light more brightly, using us more, seeing more of His goodness, more of His grace, more of His blessings. Don't ever get to a place. You know, I was listening to one, I recently uh, discovered Alistair Big, who's a uh, Presbyterian minister, but he's a fine preacher. And I've, been, I've never seen him in person, but I've been listening to his messages on, as they're recorded on the internet. He said, you know, you and I might get our, allow ourselves to be placed into a glum, but he said something, he says, Statistically, this is true. There are more people who are giving their lives to Christ in our present day. Right now, more people are being saved than have ever been saved in the history of the church. More people are coming to Christ. More churches are being founded. And if you listen to the mainstream media, they'll say, well, the, the Christian church is just going down the tubes. It's just, just everything's declining. It's just going away. Soon there won't be any Christianity. <laughs> That's just not true. It's a lie. You know what I like to do? 
I like to get on the internet and listen to those Jewish people who, guess what they found out? They found out Jesus is the Messiah. And I'm saying more and more and more. They're in interviewing these former Islamic adherents, and they found Jesus. They've given their lives to Christ. More and more people are saying, you know, Allah's not very nice. And they're coming to Jesus. Well, of all the, the bad things that are happening in the world, God is using even those things to bring people to himself. Don't forget that. And uh, take a little time to get past all the subterfuge and all the cloud and the smoke and mirrors to find out really what's going on. All right, let's go on. Help my unbelief. Help my unbelief. We're believers. You know, there are only two places in the New Testament for Christians where Paul describes Christians as believers. That's who we are. That's what we do. We're believers. But we know that sometimes we have difficulty believing. Sometimes our faith is not strong. Sometimes our faith fails. Help my unbelief. I want to show you where this comes from. Are you familiar with this, where this quote? This is a quote of Scripture. Let's go on. Let's find that. In Mark's Gospel, chapter 9, starting with verse 14, we're going to read 14 through 24. It says, And when he, or Jesus, came to the disciples, he saw a great multitude around them, and scribes disputing with them. Now remember, he's just come down from the Mount of Transfiguration. Immediately when they saw him, all the people were greatly amazed and running to him, greeted him. And he asked the scribes, What were you discussing with them? What are you guys talking about? I saw a whole article, I read a little piece of it. Why did Jesus ask so many questions? He's supposed to be God incarnate and he's the Lord of all. Why is it that in the scriptures Jesus asks so many questions? Well, he's got to talk to us. He has to relate to us. He has to have a conversation. And uh, the interrogative statement is a, is, is a part of the way we talk to each other. It's how we get things out into the open. It's how we find out. Uh, you tell me. It's, it's, it's not that Jesus didn't know or that he wanted to know. He wanted them to say. Some people let things bother them. Don't let that bother you. What are you discussing with them? I want you to tell me. All right, let's go to the next slide. Then one of the crowd answered and said, actually, this is the main guy, the teacher, rabbi, I brought you my son who has a mute spirit. He has an unclean spirit. Now, don't you look at that verse right there. This man brought his son to Jesus. But the only persons or people that he could see were the disciples. That's going to happen a lot of times in your life. People are going to come to you. You need to understand they're not looking for you. Let me tell you something else. You can't solve their problems. You can't answer their questions. You can't be what they need. Now we are indeed supposed to represent Jesus. We're to tell people about Jesus. We're to point people to Jesus. We're to be Jesus people. They're looking for Jesus. And they need Jesus. Only He will do. I brought my son to you. And he says, and whenever it seizes him, that spirit, it throws him down. He foams at the mouth. He gnashes his teeth and becomes stiff and rigid. So I spoke to your disciples that they should cast it out, and they could not. Don't ever, we, we must never, we, as children of God, we must never be dismayed by what we are not. We can't be, allow ourselves to be cast down because of what we can't do. It's easy to do that. I can't do this. I'm not this. I'm not that. But he is. He is. They could not. Sounds like a tragedy, doesn't it? Oh, that's the end of the road. That's the, that's the last gunfire. That's all there is. That's all she wrote. No, it's not. Now, he'd given them great power, and there are things that he wants to do in and through us. There are things he wants us to accomplish. There, are, there, there is something that we are. There are many things that we are when we're in him. And there are many things that we can do that we could never do otherwise. Well, let's go on to the next slide. 
And he answered him and said, O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him to me. Now, I think Jesus is saying this lightheartedly. It's how you might look at your children and say, what am I going to do with you? How am I going to put up with you? How, am I, how in the world is this going to get done? They brought him to him, and when he saw him, immediately the spirit convulsed him, and he fell on the ground and wallowed, foaming at the mouth. So he asked his father, how long has this been happening to him? Again, giving the father, he wants him to be a part of this. He wants to, to engage the father. And he wants everybody there to know this is not something new that has stricken this young boy. I want you to help me juggle this a little bit, Carter. If you would close this PowerPoint presentation. And there's a video on the desktop called Jesus of Nazareth. It's one of my favorites, favorite uh, uh, film representations of the life of Christ. If you would bring the lights down and the sound up and play that, I want you to watch this. It, it takes a little time, just a few minutes long, though. Take the sound up, it's a little bit loud. Jesus. 
There's a lot of demonic activity. There's a lot of uh, this. Uh, a lot of the things that Jesus faced were attributed to the spirits of darkness, the uh, consorts of, of Satan himself. And so I, I believe it was unique. It was strange and unusual. I don't believe that, that it was a, that people in Jesus' time ever saw anything like that before. But I believe that the Holy Land, perhaps much as it is today, was crawling with the agents of the Dark Lord. Well, I love to watch that. His eyes fall upon Jesus, and then he looks at his Father. Let's look at that. We're going to go on. How long has this been happening? Look at that next slide. And he said, from childhood. And often he's thrown him both into the fire and into the water, trying to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. You know, if you had a son like this, this would be, and I always have been, an us kind of situation, hadn't it? There's nothing that happens to your son or your daughter or your grandchild, your, to your husband or to your wife. When it happens to them, it's happening to you. Amen. Have, help us. Have compassion on us. Well, we hurt for our children, don't we, and our, our loved ones, our friends. It breaks our heart. It troubles our mind. And sometimes they're not even in a situation where they can or will seek the Lord's help. And, and we want so much for them to know the Lord and to, to trust in the Lord. And it, 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 that's just another element. It, it may be what they're suffering that they don't relate it to their relationship to, to God at all. And it may be directly related. But we're going through it with them. It pains us. It, it moves us. And we shed many tears over it. Have help us. And Jesus said to him, If you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. Leave the slide right there for just a minute. If you can believe. Now there's the sermon, isn't it? That's the point. That's the lesson. That, that's the importance. And yet you and I know. Now he's making this statement because it's true and because it needs to be made and we need to comprehend that. But in all the workings of God and all of the ways that we see in the scriptures of God reaching out and reaching down to us, to men, women, and children, we often find it just as difficult to believe as we ever did to obey you know the New Testament points to the Old Testament laws and the sacrifices. And the New Testament writers say sacrifices didn't get the job done. It didn't work. What the, what the law could not do, the writer of Hebrews said. What the law could not do. We couldn't keep the laws. We couldn't be obedient enough. And then Jesus comes and says, believe. Faith. And yet sometimes to me when I'm praying, I said, Lord... Faith is like a black hole and it just seems to be sucking everything down into it. And yet, I want to show you something here. Let's look at the next slide. Immediately the father of the child cried out with, and said with tears, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. You see, what's going to happen to this boy is going to happen through faith. It's going to happen through belief. But this father is being so genuinely honest. Look, you wouldn't be here this morning if you didn't believe in Jesus. And, Je and this man could look at Jesus. Let's go to that last slide there, Carter. He could say, Lord... I wouldn't have brought my son here. I wouldn't have gone all this trouble to bring this maniac to the temple. I wouldn't have brought him to you if I didn't think there was a chance that you could help him. I wouldn't have brought him here. I'm trying to believe. I'm trying to show you. I'm putting myself in a position where 
something can change. And he was, do you sense the desperation in the hurt? Now, how long has this been happening? And I want you to hear these words differently. Let him, let him, don't listen to me. Listen to this father say to him, from childhood. I don't know how old he is now. Since he was a little boy. Since this has been happening for a long time. This has been happening for a long time. Do you hear the father saying that? And then it says he cried. He wept out loud. I, I do believe. Hell my unbelief. I don't know who that man was. When I meet him in heaven, I'm going to say, and you nailed it. You, you hit it. You said it. I, I do believe. I want to believe. I'm trying to believe. I believe him. You see, I'm, I'm thinking like this. I almost did an extra lamb service just for us. And this is what I do. I bring a big uh, glass, a big a clear glass, and I would, I would fill it up with fresh water right out of the water bottle. Fill it almost to the top. And I started to do that, and I say, "All right, I got too much on my plate. I can't remember all that." Or you have to use your imagination. And then I was going to take just a little bitty pinch. I have a box right here. I got some at the house. Terry brought it for some reason. But anyway, it's rat poison. And I'd give me just a little pinch of that. Not much. Just hardly a pinch. And I'd sprinkle it in that water. If you drink that water, even though there's a lot of water, and just a little bitty tiny pinch of rat poison, that would be enough to make you sick or maybe even kill you. Our faith is not like that. Jesus said if you just have a little pinch, just a little bitty tiny seed of faith, you can move mountains. And if you just take that, if you allow that to be dropped into your life, this man was saying, I think I got a little bit of what it takes. I'm almost sure I don't have enough. There's something that Jesus can do for you that I can't do for you. And I think you need it. I know that I do. He can help your unbelief. I have fears and anxiety. I worry. Sometimes I have bad dreams. Sometimes my imagination runs away with itself. Sometimes dark clouds and things come over me and fog my thinking in my heart. I, I came to grips early in my Christian walk and Christian knowledge and Christian learning and discipleship that, that I... I was going to have, always have problems with obedience. <laughs> I was going to be disobedient. And, but God had grace for me. And then there were going to be times when I, I wanted to believe. I desperately needed to believe and I just couldn't. And I found out this, this father's praying a prayer. Help my unbelief. And Jesus did. I'm not even going to read the rest of this story because you've kind of seen it in video. He didn't chide that man. He wasn't chiding us when we say, oh, generation. Oh, faithless generation. Yes, we're faithless. But he's the found and the source of all faith. And if we're looking to him for it, we're looking in the right place. We're headed in the right direction. We're on the right path. That's, 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 the, way, that's the place to look. I don't know what you're struggling with or wrestling with or it's been since your childhood or something new or recent. Difficulties, 
challenges, troubles. I don't know if you have as much darkness surrounding you all the time and seem to be following Jesus everywhere he went. <clears throat> I saw a video this week. He was talking about so I want to tell this guy, saying, I'm going to give you great graphic paintings and drawings. He says, I want to tell you about the time when the archangel Michael and the archangel Satan, Lucifer, did battle with each other. And he says, the Bible's already told you about a battle that took place in heaven millennia ago and how the forces of darkness and all the workers of evil that wanted to follow Satan were cast out. And he says, I want to direct your attention to the, verse, the verses in the book of Jude when it talks about the great battle between Michael and Lucifer. There's Michael. And what it is, is that God has sent Michael down to gather up the body of Moses. Moses has died, and he says, I want you to go down there and get Moses' body and bring it back. God sending the archangel Michael to go down there. And he says, when he got down there, the devil was going to fight him for the body of Moses. I don't know what he was going to do. Probably put it up on a pole somewhere and let everybody worship him. So this guy said, here it is. The line is drawn. There's the body of Moses between them. And there's the archangel Michael with his great wings and all of his armaments and his sword. And there's Lucifer. There's Satan, the wicked one. And he's going, ah, come on, let's, let's do this. Let's have a fight. Let's throw down. And he said, and then the battle began. Jude tells us that he looked, that Michael looked at Lucifer and said, the Lord rebuke thee. <laughs> The Lord rebuked. He didn't throw a punch. He didn't swing a mace or an angelic sword. He said, the Lord rebuke you. There's a lot of things going to come. Did you, did you ever get it on the playground at school? It was called. You know what it was, don't you? The double dog dare. Did you ever get that one? I double dog Barry. I double. Here's this line. I remember Larry Webb threw a line on my face. He said, All right, cross that, just cross that line. And I went, Now I'm on your side. He punched me in the belly. <laughs> I act like it didn't hurt. I didn't even act like I could still talk. <laughs> I couldn't even breathe. And I just looked him in the eye like, You hit like a girl. Anybody ever told you that? He'd like a girl. He'd like a girl. I ever thought if somebody ever tied me to a chair, some gangster or something, some wise guy from a movie, and he was just beating the snot out of me, I'd say, if I could just utter, I, I've got two choices. Either, like Captain America, I would say, I can do this all day. <laughs> or I would say, you hit like a girl. You hit like a girl. I'm, I'm pretty sure that wouldn't be a smart thing to say. Probably couldn't keep it from jumping out. Don't do that. Don't be a smart aleck. Don't be a tough guy. I think Michael was probably a tough guy. Don't you think so? Pretty tough guy. God was going to slay about 35,000 Amalekites one time. He sent one angel. He said, oh, I'll do it. The Bible says they all woke up. You know what they woke up? They all woke up dead. That's exactly what the Bible says. They, and the next one, they all woke up dead. You didn't know that? Go read that. And the next morning, they all woke up dead. <clears throat> when that, whatever it is, is snarling at you and wants to devour you, and his jaws are dripping with saliva. And he's hungry. And he wants to take you down. He wants to wipe you out. You look at him. 
you roll up your sleeves, you snort up real good, get your feet planted, and say, the Lord rebuke you. The Lord rebuke thee. And he's going to go, ah, I hate, I hate that. I hate that. You know what James said? He said, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. I've heard some people say, rebuke the devil. Oh, no. Don't rebuke the devil. Don't ever look at the devil and say, devil, give me a fit. Don't ever do that. Don't ever do that. You ever heard this before? If you ever hear a knock on the door of your heart, who is it? If he says, it's Dave, man, then it's really the wrong show altogether. But anyway, who is it? It's the devil. Say, Jesus, would you get the door? It's for you. Yeah. Jesus opens the door to your heart, steps up to the threshold, and the devil says, Well, never mind. Never mind. That's a good strategy. I'm sharing it in flippant ways I know. I want to make an impression upon you. That's the way you do spiritual battle. If there's someone that you're watching lose their battle in life, all you can do is do your best to get them to Jesus. I, I don't want to tell them what all this man went through to get his son to Jesus that day. I don't think it was probably easy. Some people had to tear the roof off to get their loved one. It's, it's hard. Don't lose hope. It's like one of those men said, said, if we can get him in there, I know we're going to have to carry him home. We can just get him in there, I know we're going to have to carry him home. If I can just get him to Jesus, he'll be in his right mind. I know it. I believe it. You must have this strategy in your life. You must not despair. You must not become overcome or discouraged. You must keep up and keep on. You must never give up. Never give up. And let Him fight all of your battles. You don't have to win. Maybe you have lots of unbelief. Just say, I'm going to need some help with that. He's going to say, I got it. I got it. My, my granddaddy and my daddy and his brother used to have to cut wood for the stove with a big old cross-cut saw. And uh, my daddy was just a little bitty fella. His brother was kind of a big, muscular young boy. And uh, Granddaddy Bain would say, y'all need to get that wood cut. And Howard would say, I, we would, but Walt is riding the saw. Dad would say, I ain't riding the saw. He's riding the saw. You see, what that means is, is the saw is going back and forth. Sometimes it was just, it looked like you were sawing if you just kind of got onto it and just let the saw pull you back and forth. I don't know if Daddy was riding the saw or not. I wouldn't put it past either one of them. you got a lot of wood to cut. And to be honest with you, you need to just ride this off. And let the Lord Jesus fight all of his battles, your battles for you. That's hard. It's easy to say and hard to do. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your goodness and grace. Lord Jesus, thank you for who you are. I, I don't understand all of this about the powers of darkness and the devil, but I I see his hand on many things and in many lives around me. I, I see him trying to destroy the people that I love. And he's come to my door many times. Help my unbelief.
Help my unbelief. Help my lack of obedience. Help me. Help me. Just as sure as Peter was sinking below the waves, you reached down and you pulled him up and you walked him back to the ship. Lord, take my hand. Help my unbelief. Not just for me, but for all the people that I'm trying to get to you for help. I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Brother Danny, what's our hymn of invitation today? 433. Number 433 is God spoken to you through his word, through this wonderful story of a victorious Jesus in the life of a man.